Malcolm Gladwell, book number six out this week, Talking to Strangers. Uh, what is the, the premise of this book, your latest book? Uh, the premise of this latest book is that um, we're not very good at talking to strangers. <laughs> um, I was struck by how many of the kind of contemporary high-profile controversies that we find ourselves in come down to the same problem, that two people who didn't know each other very well attempt to communicate and fail, um, or attempt to understand each other and fail. Bernie Madoff, people, all kinds of people had conversations with Bernie Madoff and didn't never understood who he was. The Jerry Sandusky case at Penn State, the Brock Turner sexual assault case at Stanford a few years back. These are failed um, communications. Uh, and the one that really um, the book starts and ends with, and the signature case I'm concerned with is the Sandra Bland case, which is the one of those high-profile um, encounters between African Americans and and law enforcement that was <coughs> excuse me so much in the news a few years ago, um, which was a conversation between a young black man, a young black woman, and a police officer who pulls her over, and the conversation goes off the rails. Um, and I wondered why is it. Why is it that we that we fail in these these conversations with strangers, and that's where the book comes from? Each one of your books has explored an aspect of human communication. What is it about this topic that you keep coming back to? It? Why is it so important to you? I don't know. You know, I just think it's endlessly. No one loves a transcript more than me, um, and I I um, am sort of keenly interested in how people express themselves and how they succeed and fail at that. And um, I'm one of those people who, if someone is articulate, I'm, I'm all in. I, I find myself so... I had a, I, I, one of the people who interviewed me when I was on my... I did a little press tour of England. And I was interviewed by the actor Russell Brand, who has a podcast, a very popular podcast in England. And I'd never met him before. Knew, only knew him from the movies. And... He starts to talk, and I realize he's one of those astonishingly articulate people. And I was just kind of so in awe, and fit my whole time trying to figure out why, how is it this man is so has so has so commanded my attention, and his choice of words was I was I, I was having difficulty answering his questions because I was so focused on like thinking about oh my goodness I can't believe how the, you know the brilliant way he phrased that, and then I would be like oh I have to answer. Um, so there's, I don't know, I'm just drawn to that, um, that whole aspect of, of, um, of human nature. For our conversation, we've actually pulled some clips that help to illustrate some of the things you talk about in the book. And I want to start with the Sandra Bland story. And uh, this, is a, this is a very available video if people want to watch the entire thing. But we have just a small clip. Let's watch, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about it. You okay? I'm waiting on you. you this is your job. I'm waiting on you. What do you want me to Oh, you seem very irritated. I am. I, I really am. But I feel like this trap is what I'm getting a ticket for. I was getting out of your way. You were speeding up, tailing me. So I move over and you stop me. You mind putting out your cigarette, please? Come mind. I'm in my car. Why do I have to put out my cigarette? Well, you can step on out now. I don't have to step out of my car. Step out of the car. Step no, out of the car. No, you don't have the right. Step not, out of the car. Do not, don't touch me. Get no, out of the car. Don't touch me. I'm not under arrest. You don't have the right to say You me. are under arrest. I'm under arrest for what? 25 County FM. You I'm going to drag you out of here. So you're going you're to drag me out of my own car. Get out of the car. Right. And then you I will light me? you up. Get out. Wow. Now. Wow. Get out of the car. Really for a failure to signal. You're doing all of this for Get over there. That the that interaction ended in tragedy. How? Three days later, <clears throat> she's she's imprisoned because for resisting arrest, and then three days later, she hangs herself in her cell. Um, you know, a tragic and unexpected result. But the whole that exchange that we saw, which by the way goes on and on and on and on, we only saw a small snippet of it. Um, is uh, that was the kind of when I first saw that online, that was when I realized what I wanted to write about. Because if you break that exchange down moment by moment, you see multiple failures of 
understanding of empathy of a million things. So just for example in the in the in the in the segment we just saw, she lights a cigarette. And we know we now know that Sandra Bland was someone who had struggled with emotional problems. Um she had a failed suicide attempt a few months earlier. Um she's upset and she also has several thousand dollars in outstanding traffic fines. So being pulled over by a police officer is consequential for her. She this has happened before. She's deeply in debt because of it. And <clears throat> so she's upset when she gets pulled over and she lights a cigarette to calm her nerves. The way that many smokers will tell you that's why they smoke, right? To kind of calm down. So she's trying to stay under control and in an unconscious way I think trying to signal to the police officer I don't want this to go awry. I'm trying to calm down and he won't let her. And he sees her lighting the cigarette as an act of defiance. Right? It's a sort of fun and throughout if you watch the entire videotape you're constantly you see the two of them are talking entirely past each other and that he is reading her disquiet and distress as um as as evidence of something sinister as evidence of her being dangerous or malicious or crim- you know criminal in some way it's this kind of um epic misunderstanding and i wanted to kind of so over the course of the book i i i sort of try to break it down and then by reference to other stories try and come to an understanding of how it is a very 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 straightforward conversation can end in tragedy so you write uh, of this that you'd been thinking about these concepts for a while and that the, uh, you watched this video countless times and you kept finding yourself getting angrier and angrier mm-hmm. mine's a process question so uh, it's been 6 years since you've produced a book you've got ideas germinating in your head what was it about this that crystallized yes this is the topic i want to explore well i had been um uh kind of uh drawn to all of those encounters problematic encounters between African Americans and police officers you know beginning with Ferguson and because they all seem to be about to me to be extraordinarily multi-layered on one hand they were deeply personal they were about police officers confronting someone and something going you know something going wrong someone getting shot someone but on the other hand like so Ferguson's a really excellent example you know when the department of justice report comes out on Ferguson there's two reports one report is about the actual conduct of the police officer and what happened between the officer and Michael Brown and that report explains why the officer is not being indicted on civil rights charges because it's unclear that he did anything that was in um sort of obvious violation of the law The other uh second Department of Justice report which is perhaps more important was one about the, the Ferguson Police Department and s- pointed out that the police department had been essentially a predatory force on the African American community of Ferguson they had been essentially using their power and authority to levy fines on as many different people as they could in order to fill the city's coffers the city was running itself on tickets. And so cops were encouraged to write tickets for everything. And the list of when you see the kinds of things the police force had been engaged in over the previous couple of years, your jaw drops. You're like this is a town where the African American community was so completely alienated from the police force because of the way the police force was behaving. And that's the context for Ferguson. So really you have a <clears throat> If you only look at the encounter you miss the real story. The real story is what happened before years and years and years of the police force essentially using the black community like an ATM. Um in a way that no police force is supposed to do. Uh and that 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 so one it's funny the one of the DOJ reports was exculpatory and the other was so was such a kind of devastating a, a critique of what had happened in Ferguson and they sat side by side. and in order to understand Ferguson you have to read both um that struck me as incredibly interesting that um because i think we have a tendency sometimes when we look at these kinds of encounters to only do the first look the personal look to look at the 
interaction between the cop and the, and think we can settle the issue if we can figure out exactly what happened in that interaction. But that, the Ferguson reminds us that no, 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 you're, that just is the beginning of your job. You then have to take a step back and say, well, what was, what were the environmental conditions that surrounded and predated that encounter? And I wanted to do something like that with Sandra Bland, um, only go even broader and start pulling in, you know, Madoff and Amanda Knox and all the other cases I talk about as a way of shedding light on that. Um, encounter. And you spent three years, you write, on this project. And uh, if you look at the extensive notes that you have in the back, lots of documents read, never met a transcript you don't like, and uh, lots of travel and lots of interviews. It, it's, I guess people wonder who follow you with the really limitless vignettes or examples, case studies that you could bring to bear on a topic. How do you end up selecting the ones that say, yes, this helps me with this point? Yeah. Well, I mean, there is no procedure there's it's an art it's sometimes you're successful at it sometimes you're not successful at it um you look for i like to tell a variety of stories just to remind people that the what the stakes are you know if you if every story i told in this book was a was a story of an encounter between a young african american and a police officer then people would think oh i'm malcolm's just talking about what he says He writes a book about talking to strangers. He's just talking about interactions between police officers and black people. Um, I don't want that. I don't want this to be... I don't want to give people reason to pigeonhole this. I'm trying to say something that's actually quite broad about the way all of us um, uh, talk to strangers. And I, you know, it's funny that... I honestly don't believe... I think that many of us could have made the same mistakes that that police officer in that video made, that Brian Insinia made. I don't think he's an unusually inept or incompetent or biased or... I think he's a police officer who was inexperienced and over his head and jumped to some conclusions he didn't. But, you know, we all do that. That's the point of the book, that unless... It's just that we're making our mistakes in far lower stakes situations. We're not police officers with guns stopping people on the street, right? When I screw up in my understanding of a stranger, what's the consequence? Someone doesn't like me or I feel uncomfortable. No one's dead. Um, so that's the, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, that I'm, um, this book is really meant to be, to make us all complicit in, um, in some of these um, uh, uh, tragedies. Um, one of the concepts that you say that we all do is that we default to truth. What does that mean? So this is an idea that comes from a psychologist named Tim Levine, who, um, whose work I rely on a lot in talking to strangers. And he was trying to understand um, <clears throat> why it is a puzzle that's, that has, uh, has obsessed psychologists for a long time. Why are human beings so bad at detecting deception? We're, this has been studied a million different ways, but basically... My ability to tell whether you're lying to me is scarcely better than chance. Um, we're terrible at it, almost all of us, with a few small exceptions. And that's puzzling because you would think we would be good at it, right? You would think that would be something that evolution would have selected for. And his explanation is that evolution does not select for the ability to detect lies. It selects for the opposite. It, it selects for people who are willing to believe implicitly believe what they're told. Because if you do that, if you trust, um, if you default to truth, as he says, then your life is so much easier. You can start companies. You can form groups. You can, you know, you can send your kids up to school and not worry. You can, there's a million things you can do if you believe what people tell you. You can go into a store and you can buy, go to a grocery store and buy a hundred items and be satisfied that the bill they give you at the end is accurate, right? Like, which is sort of an extraordinary thing. There are a hundred opportunities in your shopping cart for someone to cheat you. But how often do you see someone in a grocery store say, wait a minute, I don't believe it's $119, right? The only time I've ever seen anyone do this, actually, is my tangent. My father, who was a mathematician and had a gift for doing sums in his head, would count along with the checkout person, and only if they undercharged him would he correct them. Now, this is in the day before 
bar, bar, barcode scanners. But I remember being a little kid, and I would just see him looking, and he would... And then he would say, actually, I owe you an extra 75 cents, and he would sort of fish it out. And out. But he wasn't doing it because he mistrusted. He was, for him, it was a kind of power trick. But, um, but the point is that... Levine's point is that the reason we're able to do this as human beings, build this, these fabulous working societies, is that we trust... Right, implicitly and automatically, and so if you understand that, you realize that uh, there's a cost of that. And this is his argument: the cost is that we will be, um, we will occasionally be deceived. We're not good at spotting the scam artist, and that is the, you know, that's why Madoff exists. It's not because Madoff is some kind of genius. It's because if you set out to systematically lie people, you, you'll get away with it, at least in the short term. They're not going to catch you, right? We're not, we're not thinking, is this guy lying to me? No, we're thinking, oh, he's got great returns. Here's a million dollars. That's the way we, we operate. Well, <clears throat> speaking of Bernie Madoff, uh, d- dipping into C-SPAN's video archive, we have a video of uh, someone who also is in your book, Henry Markopoulos. Um, let's listen to what he has to say to the SEC after Bernie Madoff. I gift-wrapped and delivered the largest Ponzi scheme in history to them, and somehow they couldn't be bothered to conduct a thorough and proper investigation because they were too busy on matters of higher priority. If a $50 billion Ponzi scheme doesn't make the SEC's priority list, then I want to know who sets their priorities. You call him a holy fool. Yes. So he is, Macopolis is the guy, he's not the only one, but he's almost the only person who saw the truth in Bernie Madoff. Ten years before Madoff was finally busted, Markopoulos was going to the SEC saying, this guy's running a massive Ponzi scheme, and nobody would listen to him. So he is a rare example of someone who does not default to truth. And I refer to people like him as holy fools, which is a a term, a Russian term, to describe um, the the kind of, the, the crazy person who nonetheless has access to truth that none of us see. So the child who's not constrained by social convention and pointing out the truth, the, the kid who says the emperor has no clothes is a holy fool, right? Um, now, Markopoulos is fascinating because the question arises, well, do we want to be like Markopoulos? Markopoulos could see a fraud that the rest of us could not see. He had insight that the rest of us did not have. Do we want to be like Markopoulos? Would our society be better if there were more Markopoulos? And I say no, that... You don't want to be like Markopoulos because Markopoulos is, and he will tell you this, I sat down with him, we talked about it, he's someone who is extraordinarily suspicious and paranoid. He thinks there's a scandal under every rock. He goes around the world. Every day of his life is filled with a great fear that he's being scammed. He goes to the doctor and he lectures, lectures the doctor on you know, all the ways, don't, don't do this to me or don't do this to me. I am, you know, I'm aware of all your tricks. And he, in fact, was... So paranoid that after he, um, after uh, uh, Madoff was finally busted, um, Markopoulos came to believe that um, Madoff was going to send hitmen to kill him. And then he became convinced that the SEC was going to send a squad of attackers to break into his house and steal his files. And he stayed up all night with a gun trained at the front door of his house. I mean, you don't want to live like that, right? I mean, there is a cost to having that kind of insight. And that's Levine's point, is that that insight, the cost of that insight, is too high. You don't, you don't, you know, you were much better off um, uh, being gullible, or at least being believe, defaulting to truth, being people who implicitly believe, because liars like Madoff are rare. And although we'll get cheated once in a while, it's not the end of the world. And I actually think that's profoundly wise. But should we be better at listening when someone is saying the sky is falling? Well, it depends. I mean, the unknown question with Markopoulos is how many times does he say there's a fraud and there isn't one? So he, just a few weeks ago, actually came out with an announcement that he thought that General Electric was engaged in one of the largest accounting scandals of all time. And it seems, I don't know yet, the story hasn't played out yet, but lots, lots of people just shrugged and said, no, I think you've, you're, you're, um, you're off the mark in this case. So I don't know... Um, you know, certainly we would do well to, we shouldn't ignore them, but we have to understand the difference in the way that most of us are calibrated. 
and that this, it's a good it's probably a good thing to be trustworthy or certainly one should not take from the Madoff scandal I think the conclusion that the financial industry needs to be even more heavily regulated um, if you reduce everyone in a complex industry to a state of suspicion and paranoia then you destroy the thing you're trying to save right our next example from your book is a very different kind and it's from Michigan State and mm-hmm. Penn State uh, the Jerry Sandusky scandal and Dr. Nasser. Uh, let's watch the video and we'll come back and talk about that he was coming to me with a concern because you know and I guess in his words somebody had talk to him about um, inappropriate behavior in the shower. Mm-hmm. So that... And you told him we were, this is... Yeah, I, mean, I told him that I, you know, it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, there wasn't, in my mind, there wasn't inappropriate behavior. Well, the court said differently, and he's now serving a long prison sentence. Uh, what should we take away from this and also the Michigan State situation? Yeah. So I have a chapter on the Sandusky case. And what interests me about the Sandusky case is not Sandusky himself, but rather what the prosecutors did after they convicted Sandusky. They went after the leadership of Penn State for a failure um, to to uh, act earlier on uh, uh, to prevent Sandusky's misbehavior, um, which I think is absurd. And I said, go through chapter and verse why the prosecution was asking people in positions of leaders leadership to do things that they should not do. That is essentially what the charge. So the president of Penn State was forced to resign, and is still ten years later, almost ten years later fighting um, a legal battle to stay out of jail. Uh, The athletic director and the vice president of Penn State both were convicted and were sent to jail as a result of the scandal. In my mind, they did absolutely nothing wrong, Um, except that they did what human beings do, which is they defaulted to truth. They were presented with um, incredibly vague uh, uh, questions about Jerry Sandusky. And they chose to interpret them in the way that was most favorable to Sandusky. They defaulted the truth when it came to this man who was in their employ. They said, you know what, I don't really know what that is. It sounds like, you know, maybe he's engaging in mildly inappropriate behavior or has boundary issues. Let's just say you can't take showers at the Penn State facility anymore. That's, that, that decision landed them all um, either in prison or um, on the verge of going to prison. Um, If you examine the case closely, what you discover is that this is a classic example of the kind of thing that, as human beings, we are inclined to shrug off. Like Levine's point is that when you default to truth, you believe in the truthfulness of what you are told until the doubts rise to a level so high that you can no longer uh, continue by that, abide by that original position. So there's a high bar. So you see that with Madoff. Lots and lots and lots of people on Wall Street had doubts about Madoff, but the doubts just didn't reach the point where they were willing to to concede, make the enormous step to say he's a Ponzi schemer. Um, With Sandusky, there were all these kinds of whispers, and he was seen showering with young boys. But what was seen was incredibly vague, and even the even the football coach who spotted Sandusky in the shower went home that night told a medical doctor who was a friend of his family about what he had seen, and even the doctor who had a, who has a legal duty to report child abuse didn't report it. Why? Because it was too vague. He was like, I didn't, couldn't figure out what he saw. It looked a little weird. He was a little upset by it, but he... And then the ki- then the same coach waits six weeks and tells Joe Paterno, the coach at Penn, Penn State, who then tells the leadership the next day. And their response is, well, if, it, if this was so pressing, why'd you wait so long to tell us? And he doesn't actually say he saw a sexual act being committed. He saw something that just made him feel weird. And they're like, well, what what do we do with that, right? They default to truth. That's what we do as human beings. And the absolute last thing we want to do is to tell people in positions of 
running major institutions, that they should start being paranoid about all of their employees. You cannot run an effective intellectual community if you are deeply suspicious of every act of, you know, inexplicable behavior or mildly inexplicable behavior by your employees. You can't do that. Nor can you, by the way, just in the same way that you can't run a regulatory agency, if every single, even mildly, um, uh, even mild diverg diverg digression from the absolute straight and narrow triggers a massive investigation. You, what you do is you, you act when there is an overwhelming amount of evidence. There was not an overwhelming amount of evidence in that case. And it's a, it is very easy in hindsight, I think, to get on your high horse and say, these people should have been truth tellers. They should have seen into the heart of Jerry Sandusky. Well, guess what? Pedophiles go, go to extraordinary lengths to hide what's in their heart. You had to be working on this during the whole time of the Me Too uh, mm -hmm. revelations. How did that, which is not pedophilia, of course, but improper sexual uh, re relationships and advances, how did that figure into your thinking about this? That's interesting. You know, uh, so the problem, I mean, a good analogy and a good way of discussing this is to make reference to the other case you were talking about, the Larry Nasser case which is a much more straightforward case than Jerry Sandusky, where, you know, here was a doctor at Michigan State who was treating young gymnasts, and he was sexually abusing them repeatedly over and over again, sometimes in the presence of their parents. And uh, it took 15 years for him to be brought to justice, um, not because people in positions... In the case of Michigan State, unlike Penn State people in positions of authority were being told quite explicitly that wrongdoing was happening, and they chose to either disbelieve it or shrug or look away. Um, there, I think, some of the leadership absolutely does belong in jail. There was the condition of there being overwhelming evidence was met, I think, in the case of Michigan State. What's fascinating about that, though, in the context of Me Too, is how long it takes people, even parents of children who are being abused, to take the charge seriously. In other words, it takes years and years and years and years and years for people who are intimately connected to these victims to, to kind of um, accept the fact that something as heinous as um, a sexual crime has occurred. And that, to me, uh, is the same lesson, is a lesson that runs throughout me, too, that you know, this kind of behavior has been going on for, I mean, millennia. But in our society, it's been going on for as long as women have been in the workforce or women have been... It's taken until now for us to take it seriously. You know, the Bill Cosby, or a better example would be, um, uh, would be uh, Harvey Weinstein. It was, you know, I, I live in New York. I know people in the film industry. You know, it's been an open secret for years and years that he was doing unconscious his behavior around women was unconscionable I mean I've, I'd heard people talk about it I, you know 10 years ago the New York Times 5 or 6 or 7 years ago tried to do a story on it just couldn't get people to speak on the record I mean there was nothing this wasn't something that popped up in 2018 this was an open secret in these worlds for a decade or more, but it takes an extraordinarily long time for people to come to grips with the, sort of the enormity of this crime and to kind of find a way to do something about it. And that's, to me, the, the sort of intriguing lesson. Last, uh, I think, example from this, because our time evolves, uh, really evaporates quickly, is actually uh, another person that's in the news right now, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Mm -hmm. uh, his uh, military court judge has just set his trial date for January 2021. Um, let's watch a piece of video and help us understand how he fits into what you're talking about here. I've dealt with 13 or 14 of the worst ones, right? Uh, uh, KSM, uh, Zubaydah. Uh, Ramsey Ben uh, uh Al Nashri, the Cold Bomber. Um, I've dealt with a lot, and none of them refused to identify what they had done. I mean, so it wasn't a matter. We weren't looking for confessions because confessions won't stop attacks. 
What stops attacks is, in, is actionable intelligence. And the way that you could get the actionable intelligence dealt with is by to get through these enhanced interrogations, get them working with you so that you can use social influence after that to get the information that you want. One of the lead interrogators of KSM. Yes, yes, who I talked to at length as well. Um, and who uh, I found, I mean, genuinely interesting and fascinating person who was asked to do an extraordinarily difficult job, um, which was to interrogate some of the most hardened terrorists um, in the world. And what he was doing is a very good example of he had to talk to strangers, right? I mean, it's a, it's a tech... The enhanced interrogation post-9-11 is a textbook example of what my book is about, which is the difficulty of of seeing the truth or truly understanding what someone, what a stranger um, is saying or telling you. Um, in his case, he, you know, he's quite open about it, resorted to some, uh, well, enhanced or others might say extreme measures to try and facilitate the communication um, with the with the, with the stranger, with the terrorist. And the question I raise in the chapter is, um, what happens when you do that? So, faced with the same problem that all of these case studies I've talked about are faced with, which is you have someone who you don't fully understand and you are tasked with getting the truth out of them, finding the truth. And we see how Brian City, the police officer, botches it with Sandra Bland. He totally misunderstands what, what she's about. Um... Uh, and we see that in the other examples. I've, so in this case, though, the added element is that there was coercion, physical coercion and emotional coercion was added into the mix to try and enhance the, the truth um, discovery process. And um, in that chapter, I, the point of it is to say um, that's not without its cost either. The issue with um, using physical coercion to get someone to talk is that in using coercion you change their memories so you affect the information you're getting now so the crucial question and it's impossible to answer with certainty but the crucial question is so then is the cost of coercion worth its benefits so I can definitely make you talk if I waterboard you like right now you would talk but is in the act of waterboarding do I affect your ability to remember what you did, right? What, what there is to talk about. In other words, do I harm the, the, the conversation um, uh, in the process of trying to facilitate the conversation? Um, so you have this trade-off, and is it a good one? Um, and that's a, a question that I don't think the proponents of... Well, the proponents of enhanced interrogation answered that question very differently than the opponents of it. Um, and uh, uh, I... My feeling in the, my conclusion in the book is that I tend to side with the opponents. I tend to believe that the costs of coercion are really high, higher than we realize. And I, I talk at length to um, a, a psychiatrist who studied this very question, and he, I, think, I think he's quite convincing that you're in really uncharted territory. You don't know what to make of the information that you retrieve through physical coercion, because it's so compromised by the, by that act of coercion. So just being able to skim the surface of, of your numerous case studies in here, um, bring it all full circle. So what do you want readers to understand about your thinking and what they should be thinking about in their dis- conversations with strangers? I want people to have, I mean, I sort of end with a call for caution and humility. I want people to slow down to to understand that the task of getting to know a stranger is very, very difficult. It cannot be done quickly or easily. That some of the things you do to speed it up make the problem worse. Um, and that we need to be devise systems that account for that weakness. So the last quarter of the book is really is all about policing and law enforcement strategies. And what does law enforcement look like if you take the task of talking to strangers seriously? And the answer is police behave in a very different way, and they're far more selective in, um, uh, in how they use the sort of the most proactive tools of law enforcement. 
Um, the lesson of Sandra Bland is not that the police officer needs to be a better conversationalist when he stopped people. It's that he shouldn't have stopped her. That she only stop some. She should only stop her, someone when there is an overwhelming reason to believe that some possibly criminal thing might be taking place. And he had not. He had nothing. All he had was that he drove up behind her and she didn't use a turning signal. And that's not. And that she was a black woman without estate plates. Those are not. Those are not sufficient reasons to set in motion a potentially dangerous conversation. Why did um, you exclude from your book the way that most people interact with strangers in our society today, and that's social media? Oh, I have no interest in social media. Really? Well, I do in a sense. I use it, but does the world really need another book about social media? I just sort of thought, you know, of course that's important, I suppose, but and then there are lots of books that talk about it. It's really unnecessary for me to weigh in. I think you have to, when you're writing a book, I think you have to ask yourself the question, where can I best contribute to this conversation? And I don't think I contribute when I, just by duplicating a thousand other books that have been written about Twitter in the last year and a half. This, it's been interesting preparing for this this week as your books debuted, watching the reaction and uh, many of the conventional media critics. Uh, Los Angeles Times is one of those who loved it, wrote, at a time when the world feels intractably polarized, a book examining the varying ways we misinterpret or fail to communicate with one another could not feel more necessary. Some on the other side, uh, I was interested in the graphic in the New York Times, which I, uh, the business section, which I'm, I know uh, you saw, maybe we could show it to our, our audience. Um, it's basically said uh, Gladwell is turning to dark topics and wondering whether or not uh, your readers will respond. Mm -hmm. uh, are you turning darker in your thinking about the world? No, I don't think... I don't think... I mean, this book is not dark in the sense that it is trying to make the world a better place and trying to answer the, ask the question, uh, what can we do differently to make sure that people like Sandra Bland don't don't have the same fate, or that, you know, I had to have a long chapter on the Brock Turner case at Stanford. That's all about how can we prevent sexual abuse cases like that in the future. Those are dark topics, but the goal of the examination is positive. It's trying to make um, the world work a little better. So I don't know whether... Um, but I do think readers in these days are... These are sort of dark times. I think people are perfectly um, happy to, um, to talk about spies and frauds and uh, and police shootings and things like that. When you started to dive into the Stanford rape case, were you surprised at the statistics on alcohol abuse on American campuses? Yes. So I wanted to write about sexual abuse as a classic example of campus sexual abuse cases, many of them, don't follow the trajectory of violent rapes, of stranger rapes. They're about people meet at a party under relatively benign circumstances, have a conversation, and then something goes wrong, right? They start out in a very different way. And so I thought this would be an excellent thing to include in my book. And I began to go in to campuses and talk to people who have studied this issue. And I discovered, to my surprise, that they really only wanted to talk about alcohol. Um, and that to people who are, who, who, many people, not all of them, to many people who study this problem, they really feel that they're dealing with um, drinking. It's, that this is a, a that the, the, at the core of this is the abuse of, of alcohol on campuses and the consequences of drunkenness. And that you can't talk about sexual abuse without talking about drunkenness. And I, so they came to convince me of that. And the Stanford rape case is a, is a story about two very, very drunk people who are who meet on a dance floor. And in the case of Brock Turner, his drunkenness contributes very heavily to him engaging in criminal behavior. And in case of in the case of his victim, her drunkenness contributes uh, very greatly to the fact that she was victimized, right? So you have, and I think it's impossible to talk about how do we prevent this in the future without asking the question, how do we prevent people from being so drunk that on the one hand they greatly in increase their chances of being a criminal, on the other hand they greatly increase their chances of being a victim. 
I, I want to just, uh, for the audience, put some statistics from the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and, uh, and Alcoholism. It says that uh, drinking by college students aged 18 to 24 contributes to an estimated 1,500 student deaths every year. In addition, there are an estimated 696,000 assaults by students who have been drinking and 97,000 annual cases of sexual assault yeah. on campuses. I mean, this, these numbers are astonishing. And I think many people um, of our generation, and I'm going to um, uh, lump myself with, although I think I suspect you're much younger than I am, um, the, uh, we forget because when we, were on, when we were of college age, drinking was quite different. It has changed quite dramatically over the last uh, uh, generation. Um, you know, the, the amount of hard alcohol... Um, is way up. And, of course, hard liquor gets you drunker more seriously and far more quickly. The amount of binge drinking is way up. Um, and also, most importantly, the amount of drinking by women is way up. So that's a... Whereas in my generation, it would be unheard of for a woman to match a man drink for drink in a social setting. That is now much closer to the norm. And that has profound consequences for drunkenness because for a variety of physiological reasons. Of course, women do not process alcohol as efficiently as men do, and they get much drunker on the same amount. Um, so we have... Uh, this, is a, this is a very... Those numbers you told me are... They're astonishing. And there's a kind of... I am struck by the absence of a meaningful conversation in this country about um, how dangerous drinking patterns are. And two, I'm struck by the fact that... And I quote this in the book that when you talk to young people, people in college, they don't see this link between sexual abuse and their drinking. They see them as being disconnected. And that is madness, absolute madness. You have been exploring a number of these topics as well in your podcast, Revisionist History, which is now in its fourth season. We just finished fourth season. Just fourth season. So uh, I want to play a clip from one of your podcasts, which is actually on one of the chapters of the book, and let people get a sense of how you do that. Let's listen. Tensions rose, coming to a head on February 24, 1996. That afternoon, three Armanos El Rescate planes took off for the Florida Straits. As they neared the Cuban coastline, two Cuban Air Force MiG fighter jets shot down two of the planes out of the sky, killing all four people aboard. The response to the attack was immediate. The United States Security Council passed a resolution denouncing the Cuban government. A grave President Clinton held a press conference. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been briefed by the National Security Advisor on the shooting down today in broad daylight with two American civilian airplanes by Cuban military aircraft. So what a, a podcast, and this is also going to be uh, your yeah. uh, audio book, allows you to do, is, as we've been doing today, put real video and audio into the yeah. subject matter. How does that enhance the experience for your intended audience? Yeah, so we did... Well, I'll speak first to the audio book, so I've been doing this podcast for four years and I've learned a lot about how different storytelling is in the podcast form. It's much more emotionally immediate. And um, the idea that you can hear, once you can hear someone's voice in your ears, I feel they can, they're summoned in a much more kind of visceral way than simply reading about them on the page. And that was, wasn't obvious to me when I started that that's the way it would be, but you know, you can, with a podcast, you can move someone to tears, um, whereas it's hard, easily, whereas it's quite hard to do on the page. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's much harder to do in print. But in, just by people are, I think, are so emotionally connected to um, the things that come, come in that channel. Um, so when it came time to doing the audiobook for Talking to Strangers, because the, so much of the material in the book is so emotional, we decided to make the audiobook like a podcast. So what we just listened to was a clip of one of the chapters of my audiobook. And, you know, you heard that little clip from Bill Clinton. Well, throughout the book, you almost, you know, if I'm interviewing someone, you hear the person I'm interviewing. When, we're, when I'm describing what happened to Sandra Bland, you hear that tape we just saw of Sandra Bland and Brian Insignia. 
when Brian Insignia does his deposition, at the end of the book, we, I come back to the case and I walk through his deposition that he gives explaining his behavior that day. You hear it in his voice, right? I had the tape of the deposition. All of that means that the experience, I think, is just a lot more powerful. Um, and people who have listened to the, it's funny, people who have listened to the audiobook and read the book, is a small number, but there are some, tell me that it, it's all, it almost feels like two different books, that you're just, you're drawn to very different things and your reactions are very different. Do you have um, more fun working on the podcast than you do the labor of writing a book? Yeah. Because the podcast, it, you can do really goofy things. I mean, I do goofy things in the podcast that I wouldn't, you couldn't. I have a podcast episode on the difference of, on the, on the two chutzpahs, you know, Israeli chutzpah and American chutzpah, and they have different meanings and different pronunciations. I mean, it's a lark. You could, I'm never going to write that in a book. I mean, the, there's, a, there's a kind of playfulness that comes with the podcast um, uh, format that's not really available in serious nonfiction. Looking up the numbers, there are now 750,000 different podcasts and 30 million episodes that people can avail themselves of. How do you see this whole podcasting market shaking out over time? Well, uh, the vast majority of those podcasts um, don't earn any income for the creator and don't really have it many listeners. So the tail, we're talking about a phenomenon that has a very, very long tail, much like the book business does, only it's longer because the cost of producing a podcast is even smaller than the cost of producing a book. So anytime you have a industry where the costs of entry are essentially zero, you're going to have a very, very long tail. You're going to have tons and tons and tons and tons of entrance. That doesn't have to shake out because, you know, it's like a, people do podcasts for all kinds of reasons and maybe having listeners and making money is not central to a lot of those people in the long, in the long tail. Um, the issue is about the small number of podcasts that command a decent amount of viewers. Um, the issue is, is that, are those numbers going to grow? Will we, you know, a podcast like Joe Rogan's podcast has, I have no idea, I'm assuming he gets, let's say, 5 million downloads per episode. Um, are we, in the next 20 years, will there be, you know, five times as many podcasts with 5 million downloads a day? Or will it, or will someone like Joe Rogan go from 5 million to 20 million? I mean, that's the interesting thing is what happens to the growth at the, at the, at the far end of the tail. The sheer number of podcasts I don't think is terribly meaningful. Your partner in the podcast is Jacob Weisberg, someone you've had a long relationship. In, in fact, in a sidebar to one of the reviews, it was mentioned that you felt that he was a game changer for you in your mm -hmm. journalism career. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with him and what each oh. of you brings to the table? Yes, yeah, so Jacob was, when I first moved to Washington, D.C. in 1985, Jacob was answered an ad to be uh, a roommate in my house on Adams Mill Road in Mount Pleasant. And so I met him for the first time. He was, a, at that point, taking a year off. He was taking his uh, year off from school. He was, uh, took a break between his junior and senior years, interning at the New Republic. And he introduced me to people at the New Republic. And I began to freelance there. So he was the one who get, got me my start in journalism. Um, and he, we remained close friends ever since. And um, he has been running for many years. He ran the Slate Group. So Slate Magazine and then all of the podcasts associated with Slate as part of the Washington Post Company's digital arm. And so he's quite a, he's the, he both has extraordinary editorial sense, but he also, unlike me, knows how to run a business. So he and I started this podcast company called Pushkin, um, and he's the CEO, and I am, I am arm candy. Um, he does all of the kind of serious heavy lifting, and I, um, well, I produce my podcast for it, but I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a name on the masthead. I'm not a, uh, but I, there is no one in the world I'm happier to defer to than Jacob Weisberg. Do you also have a cat named Pushkin, or did you? No, I have many things called Pushkin. I and have, why is that? I had a dog uh -huh. growing up. We had a dog called Pushkin, and, and then subsequently we named all our dogs after Russians, Spassky, Tolstoy. Um, and uh, 
Then I call, then yes, and then I, um, I used to call my apartment Pushkin. And then. <laughs> Your apartment had a name. <laughs> I, well, sure. I, I'm English. So in England, and I come, I'm the son of an Englishman who named everything in his life. His, he named his dogs, his garden carts, his rototiller, his cars. So it's second nature for me to give things names. Um, and then people loved the name Pushkin so much that they petitioned that, it, that we would call our new company Pushkin. So there's a lot of Pushkins going around. Who was he, for people that don't know? Pushkin was a, a brilliant, uh, maybe the most famous literary figure in Russian history after Tolstoy, or even Russians are, love him. He's sort of a late 19th century poet, writer, intellectual, um, and uh, he uh, was part black which is as I am. So he's a kind of wonderful um, role model. This is going to be our last uh, dip into our archives uh, and with a bit of apologies. This is the earliest clip that we have of you in our video archives. Oh, my goodness. I wanted to show you and folks watching a little bit of this from 1996. Oh, my goodness. I want to show our viewers your piece in this. It's called Black Like Them, A Personal History. Uh, What is this about? Uh, Well, my piece was about, this is a very good example, actually, of what I was talking about. My piece is about West Indians, um, and in particular, my family, which is half West Indian. And it talks about what uh, the success of West Indians in America, and asks the question, what does the success of West Indians mean? Uh, Tell us about racism. So I I wanted to show that, not because the clip was particularly poignant, but... uh, Times have changed. Times have changed. (laughs) But as a a bit to talk about your parents just a little bit more, because Mm -hmm. in your acknowledgments, you tell us two things. First of all, that your mother taught you how to write, Mm -hmm. and that you lost your father as this book was being produced. Would you talk about the contributions that each of them has made to you as a person? Oh, uh, well, my, um, my parents... They are on the surface very different. My father was a mathematician, a kind of a rational, um, physically fearless uh, go-getter. And my mother is was a family therapist, uh, and she is a much more kind of um, uh, contemplative, soulful uh, type. But in some ways, they're very similar, and I, um, they are. Uh, they're, they were both very independent-minded, and they're um, uh, self-sufficient, and uh, um, uh, had a, uh, my father in particular, and my mother as well. Had a, my father had a great sense of mischief, um, and I, I have in, I have inherited his sense of mischief. He never took either himself or the world that seriously, and he. Um, uh, he liked. He was playful in the way he thought about ideas, and and I liked. I think at my best, I am playful about ideas, or at least I try to be. Um, so that's from my father. That's sort of my father's principal contribution. Um, and my mother has give. You know, she's a writer. She's an extraordinarily. Um, she speaks in perfectly beautiful, perfectly formed sentences that I have admired since as long as I have understood speech. Um, so. Uh, they have both helped me be who I am. Do you find yourself doing, as you described in the beginning, listening to how she says things rather than listening to what she says? Well, she has great economy of... My mother speaks... Uh, she doesn't say much, so she expresses... So I do marvel at it, but, it, you know, there's, it's not like there's... With Russell Brand, there was, like, an enormous outpouring of words to, to kind of analyze. With my mother, there would be, like, a sentence and a half. <laughs> but while we're talking about how things change, first of all, where do you do most of your writing? Do you write in your aforementioned apartment most of the time? No, I'm a coffee shop habitué. So uh, one thing that has changed over the course of your writing career is your celebrity. You've got mm-hmm. six uh, books, five of them bestsellers, longtime bestsellers. You always do extensive speaking tours, top ten podcasts. Um, so when you travel, people must recognize you. Um, you've also made a lot of money, I guess, with best-selling books over the years. So how have those two things, celebrity and wealth, changed your life? Well, I mean, I don't worry about money anymore. I suppose that's... But I never really did, so... Um, and celebrity... I don't really... I mean, celebrity is an odd word. Brad Pitt is a celebrity. Um, I'm not a celebrity. So if Brad Pitt were to walk down the street, people would mob him. I don't get mobbed when I walk down the street. What happens 
to me is somebody will say, hey, I love your podcast, and keep walking. Or they will say, you know, at the most, they'll, someone might stop me and say, can I take a picture? But it's always, it's not in the kind of celebrity awe thing. It's like I'm familiar to them. It's like I'm a... So I think of celebrity as someone who is up there, whereas people who talk to me are relating to me as a peer. It's like, I've heard you, I've read all your books, I've heard you on your podcast. You're like, it's almost like you're in my life, and they call me Malcolm, and they, they act like they've known me forever, and they sort of have. So it's, a very, it's, not a, it's an odd thing. It doesn't feel like fame. It feels like familiarity, if that makes any sense. Does it feel like a good life? Yeah, I got no complaints. So if we look across the millions of people that you reach through these three major areas, podcasting, speeches, books, and the like, what do you want your body of work to do for society? Just encourage people to look at things a little differently. I always say I'm, I don't really need, I'm not trying to persuade people of something or I'm just trying to encourage them to step out of their um, mindset for a moment. Like, just consider the problem from this perspective. You can go back to your old way of thinking at the end, but just pause for a moment while you read this chapter and or listen to this podcast and imagine what it would be like to think about this very familiar issue in a different way, the way someone else does. And that, I think, I think is as... That is something I try to do in my own life, and I think that any kind of art um, improves the world when it encourages people to um, adopt different perspectives, even if it's only fleetingly. That's, that's part of what I think makes us better human beings. Thank you for spending an hour with us today. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast at cspan.org.